Um, let me start with a little background. You guys are all Stanford students, of course. Uh, Samak and I were Stanford students, separated by, what, 20 years or something? Yep. But in the 80s, when I was into this, a real intellectual problem was decision quality. People had just understood that there was more to decision analysis than just the analysis. And we had just started to form a framework on the six spider chain. We were talking about whether it was linear or circular or whatever and came up with that, and I did a dissertation on framing, and I renamed the framing section. It used to be called the right frame, and I thought, you know, there's no absolute standard. So I came up with appropriate frame, which was a big advance, but looking back on it seems so small. Uh, and over the years, in the uh, 80s and early 90s, uh, SDG and many other organizations really made it real and applied it to lots of cases and figured out how to do it and made a lot of incremental improvements. I think the next big breakthrough came actually with the, uh, the Decision Education Foundation. This is trying to teach decision making to kids. And they realized their big aha was that there's a head and a heart side of this. And it's not all analytical. And uh, this idea rattled around and inspired uh, Somak, who's also very focused on values. And in his PhD was on values. And when he came to work for SmartOrg, um, we started playing with this idea. and. Uh, this idea of head and heart uh, really is a huge idea. And uh, so what we've done is redone decision quality uh, with this full head and heart idea in mind. So I like to think of this as decision quality now for the 21st century instead of for the 20th century. And it's a good example of what we try to do at SmartOrg. Uh, we are really about building the capability of our organizations, that is the customers we work with through software and coaching and consulting so that they can make a great decision every time routinely. And you can't do that unless you understand what actually motivates people and drives them to action. It's not actually just about having the right answer. And so that's kind of the introduction for um, decision quality, just to give you a little background. Since I've had the introduction, uh, well, where this is the decision quality framework. I think many of you have seen this before. Uh, and we've identified, we have the same six dimensions, frame, alternatives, information, value. We call this integration. It's been called like reasoning and things like that before, and commitment. And then we have mapped them all onto the head and heart. And really, it's the interaction between the head and heart is what seems to drive effectiveness. So with this introduction, um, Somak and I are going to sort of trade off and give examples <laughs> to define these different dimensions more clearly. And then at the end, we'll come back and uh, give some case examples of how this actually works and how you might unfold this and really use it. Did I miss anything, Somak? No, it's pretty good. OK. So let's start with framing. There's a little typo that should say a uh, meaningful inquiry. And so let me just kind of define those two dimensions. The uh, useful perspective is the head side of this. It's, it's instrumental. It's how do you know that you're working on something that's going to produce a functional kind of result. It's very much about having the cool head that sets the right direction. But the meaningful inquiry is unleashing a decision search that is going to matter to somebody. And uh, I have a definition of inquiry. Inquiry is a kind of question. So the distinction I'm making here is between a question to be answered, what is 2 plus 2? expect you guys to answer it, and a question to be lived. And so that's an inquiry in this terminology. And so you want to set up a question that somebody's going to live with for a while that's going to drive them forward to come up with a productive decision and come up with a great choice. So let me give you a kind of example of that. A colleague of mine, some of you uh, may know him, um, faced, there we go, his wife was unhappy with the curtains in one of their children's bedrooms. Their children had been growing up, going to college. They had this beautiful house, many kids' bedrooms. They had a little den. They had like trampolines in the backyard. And his wife was upset with the curtains. So the decision seems to be, what, how should we change the curtains? And what are some of the natural things you would think about if you're thinking about changing the curtains? Like what color and drapery, and maybe how do they match with some other things? And they, they started to go on this path a little bit. And they realized that if they were going to change the curtains, they needed to change the decor. Right? So you see I've stacked now a kind of, I'm pulling back the lens. I've gone from curtains, 
draw this for you. To decor, right? The whole room, how it fits together, how it fits in the other rooms. And so I think about repainting their kitchen because they started with this curtain question, right? That's a kind of the decor question. They work this for a little while and they realize that maybe the house isn't organized right. See, the kids are grown up, more or less, and they don't need the kids' playroom anymore. So perhaps what they should do is remodel. So that's the next kind of frame. Should I remodel the house? And they look at remodeling the house for a little while. It turns out remodeling is expensive and hard, and they want to do things that this property doesn't lend itself to. So what do you think the next possible frame is? Change house, right? So new house. So these are kind of frames, right? They control all of it. So think of the alternatives for a new house. This gets you at house shopping. You're looking at, at regions and locations, and you're talking, to, you know, here you're talking with, with designers and contractors, and here maybe you're talking with different kind of design. I guess this is architects, and this is designers, right? And then here you're talking about colors, and you're going, I mean, the, the sort of scope of action or the scope of choice is radically, radically different. So let me ask you a quick question. You can think of, think of this as a, it's a common framing pattern where you sort of, you can zoom out, or you can zoom in. You could also maybe shift a little bit to the left, a little to the right. It's not really illustrated in this example, but uh, you can kind of, uh, any of you photographers? Uh, you, you have to pick what you point the thing at. That's the point about photography. It's, if you're taking a picture of something, really you have to point the camera. This is sort of like pointing the camera. How much do you zoom it? Okay, so let's look at the first criteria, the usefulness of this. What do you think is the useful frame for them? So let's consider that a little bit. As I go this way, the problem gets more complex and more expensive, right? And if I go down here, it gets simpler and cheaper and faster. And this, I guess, is slower, right? So this really changes what I have to contemplate to get to the decision at the other side. And this, this is one of the things, this idea of usefulness, it's hard to judge in the, in the way there isn't an absolute kind of standard. So this brings me to the meaningful inquiry. This problem started with dissatisfaction with the curtains, right? So we think that is the issue, dissatisfaction with curtains. But people are funny things. And it's not sure, it's not clear to them, or to you if you're considering consulting with somebody, what, what that really means. Is that a meaningful inquiry for someone to go and look at the curtains and colors of the curtains? What does that actually stand for? Well, it, it might be for somebody. You could get a lot of excitement out of that and generate a lot of interest. But what's going on with their life that has even created this? There are no more kids. There are no more kids. Okay? So this is a huge life transition for folks. Huge life transition. So what's, what the meaning is here is reinvent our lives as empty nesters. So you see, that's a meaningful inquiry for them at the stage of their life that they're at. And that powers you through to get clear about what this decision is really about. So if I looked at it without this reinvent our lives, there's a common phrase. You ever heard this phrase, boiling the ocean? This is a framing problem. That is, you keep making the problem bigger and bigger and bigger and encompassing more things, and pretty soon you're trying to boil the ocean, and there's no way to make progress. And if I look at that stack, I say, boy, buying a new house sounds like you might be trying to boil the ocean. So I'd be worried about that, actually, at first blush. But when I connect to meaning, 
what is the life we want to create as empty nesters, it becomes much clearer. And where they actually settle is here. Which, in most circumstances, would probably be the wrong answer, but with meaning, is a, is a good one because it's actually about reinventing the life. So that's just an example of the frame, some techniques you can use to changing the frame, pan in, or zoom in, zoom out. You can also pan and do other kinds <laughs> of things. But I want to illustrate the connection between meaning and usefulness to drive something that really leads to a great decision. And in the end, they actually bought a house and then remodeled it because it wasn't the right house either, but they created a place where they could really have family come in and have young families in their house and have separate spaces and, and really found something amazing. So that's just a quick example about the meaningful frame and how these two dimensions come together. Any questions about these distinctions? Okay. Let me move on to the next. <coughs> area. Uh, this is alternatives. And the key here is distinct directions and interesting possibilities. And again, these two have to come together to really power it forward. Something I think I neglected to say at the beginning is that there's a way in which the cool head is helping you find a good answer, something that's in your interest. But it's the warm heart that is going to power you through to actually take sustained action. And unless at the end of the day you're really connected and committed to the outcome, it's, it's, it's not going to go anywhere. So distinct directions and interesting possibilities. Um, now this I want to, you guys must go shopping for clothes. Any of you ever buy suits? Okay, what color suit have you bought? Black, charcoal gray. Black or charcoal gray. Anyone have a blue suit? Yeah. Maybe some blue suits? How about, how about something a little more exotic? How about like a tuxedo? We could, you know, thinking of suits sort of broadly. So, but you might consider that thing. How many of you would consider buying a pink suit? You ever thought about wearing a pink suit? No. Probably not. And your reaction to this is pretty interesting, right? Probably most of you go, I, uh, okay, he's joking around, right? It's, you sort of withdraw. When I said tuxedo, you probably went, well, maybe. But when I said pink suit, you went, ah! <laughs> So in decision making, you've got to find the pink suit. That is, you probably need to explore alternatives which might be a little alien to you. See, decisions don't happen just they're not handed to you. you. You create them because there's something not working about your flow of life. And so staying in a momentum path is probably not going to do what you need to do or you wouldn't have come up with this. Go back to the curtain example, right? If they had stayed with just changing the curtains, it actually wouldn't address the underlying issue that created the decision in the first place. You actually have to do something new as a result of some kind of decision process. And the, a big challenge is the way to the past. Most people won't change something unless the, the fear of the future is less than the pain of the, of the sorry, I garbled this, uh, unless the pain of the present is bigger than the fear of the future. So the past has this huge drag. And one of the challenges in alternative generation is to consider ideas that are actually going to move you forward and make that possible. So this is all very the heart side of decision making, right? So how do you know that that's a good set of things? And so you've got to be willing to try on the pink suit. And one of the great things about decision analysis is you're simulating it. You're not actually putting on the pink suit. It's like going into a, uh, a store and you could go to a dressing room and you could try a pink suit on. It doesn't mean you have to buy it, but it does mean you might learn something dramatic. Uh, for example, maybe you go buy a pink tie. I don't know, but it's, it's a kind of exploration or a journey. So that's the pink suit principle. So that's uh, teeing up the sort of heart side of this, and let me show you how they come together. Let me give you sort of a more theoretical answer to the uh, explanation of what's going on here. So when folks have a break and they have a decision, the big problem is mediocrity. That is, people are going to just create something or justify something that doesn't do any better than the path they're on, and it won't actually solve the issue why they need help with the decision making in the first place. And part of that is that there is a kind of perceived solution space, which I've drawn abstractly here, 
and you've got the status quo or the momentum. What does it look like if I keep going on the way I'm on? And if you stay in that zone, what you're going to find is something that looks like a big gap to where you are now relative to that box. Now imagine the great solution is out here somewhere. I don't know that if I'm sitting inside this box, right? So that's the, that's the problem of mediocrity. And you might think it's a great answer um, when in fact it's not. And then you won't be satisfied and it won't resolve. And so you've got to move forward. So what you need to do is add creative tension. So this is the principle of creative tension. So the imagined area, you've got this, whoops, you have this imaginable solution space, which is way out here, and you need to explore that by considering options that are mild to wild, exploring just what's possible, what's feasible. This means creativity, it means interesting tests, it means all kinds of stuff to really drive those and open up those possibilities. So this is kind of where the distinct directions is coming up. Because if I want to understand that space, I need to find examples or alternatives that give me access or let me explore it. So that's the distinct direction idea. See, I want something over here and over here and over here and over here. If I just get variations on a theme, I'm not going to open up the space. You see what I'm saying? So distinct is probably more relative to the frame is probably more important than getting all the right alternatives on the, on the table. Certainly at the beginning, maybe at the end you could do some tweaking. Uh, now one thing people find um, disturbing about this <coughs> idea is that you might propose alternatives that are actually not feasible. Now they can't be, uh, maybe a better way of saying it would be, uh, you might propose alternatives that are slightly exaggerated. So there's a huge tendency to turn everything into mush. Everyone wants to compromise and make everybody's idea okay and part, you know, you suggest, okay, I incorporate into my, you suggest something, I incorporate it, you suggest something, and I end up with this big mush. It's actually better to take your idea and turn up the heat and make it a little more exaggerated because it's a pink suit. See, I'm not actually doing it. I'm trying it on. And so you might get just sort of at the edge of your solution space. A great, there's a quote by Schop I think it's Schopenhauer. He says, uh, the, uh, every man mistakes the scope of his imagination for the scope of the world. <laughs> Something like that. So this is, again, you've got to put this out. And in a group process, you may actually have different people with different ideas and just make it okay to have different ideas. So you got an idea and you think it's crazy? That's just fine. Let's make your idea as interesting as possible. I know you think it's crazy. By the way, what's your idea? Let's make your idea as best as possible, right? And just you tease it apart. And this gives a, people a way to manage conflict and, and to get these distinct directions in place. So what happens is you, that creates the creative attention in which you may find the great solution. And ultimately, whoops, I'm going backwards. And then when you do your analysis, that will generate insight that will land you at a at a, at a great solution. So to give you a more concrete example of this, this is actually done in oil wells. It's called test wells. So you're searching for oil and you place uh, inexpensive test wells at the mere millions of dollars to figure out where the oil is. Now a production well costs billions, so these are cheap. And you don't put the test wells exactly where you're gonna, you think you're going to put the production well. You put them so that you can map out the oil so that you know where to place the production well. So that's the, uh, that's the metaphor there. Um, so this metaphor and sort of what I've, is sort of theory, this is all sort of head talk, but uh, I want to hand it over to Somak who's going to explain maybe how this really shows up when you connect the head and the heart. So how many of you are international students here? Okay. So this might connect to, some, to, to your visa situation. So when I was finishing up with my PhD, I already had a job lined up with a consulting firm. And you know, it's like, a, I'll not name that company, very nice company, but that's where I was pretty much sure I was going. And then one day, Ron Howard, Professor Ron, Ron Howard, he had a visitor from some other university who was looking at Stanford and we all took this person out to lunch and we started talking about what we do in the Decisions and Ethics Center. We started talking about ethics. And we soon got into this topic. How many of you have taken Ron's class on ethics? No, highly recommended. So at, at the core of that class, they had this idea of telling the whole truth. So this visitor got very confused. Well, what do you mean? 
And suddenly, we're all trying to help, and suddenly Professor Howard gives this example, says, oh, if this company, this is the company I was planning to join, if this company calls me and says, should I hire Somic? You know, I would have to say, no, he's not a good fit. And I almost fell off my chair because that's exactly where I was heading. So I was like, what do you mean? So, and he says, oh, because, you know, these guys are interested in maximizing your profit or focused primarily on financial outcomes. And my concern was a lot broader. So I would not be a good fit. And so when he said this, I was like, oh, my God, I actually don't know what to do after I graduate. <laughs> because he's absolutely right. I, I can't go there. So, so then I, I was really stuck. And, and the decision in front of me was, as an international student, you have to get employed or you leave the country. Now, it turns out that in the F1 uh, rules, if you, look, if you read really carefully, the, there is no requirement that you actually have to get employed. You can choose to be self-employed for one year, which is really dangerous because if you don't find something by the end of it, you're out. And then I thought about it. This is really interesting possibility for me because then I could hold the space. I didn't know what I wanted to do. But I knew that it wasn't the traditional thing that, that had lined up for me. So normally, I, this was too risky an option. Most F1 students don't even consider this. But it just made so much sense and it, because of that interesting nature that David talked about that it became the right alternative for me. Now, of course, you know, the outcome is not that important. But in, as it turns out, I ended up working for a nonprofit for a, almost a year doing projects that I couldn't even dream of. We were building decision systems to save the Amazon rainforest. And I could never, in, in my wildest dreams, imagine that possibility. But I could only do it because I'd held that space and not committed to something else. I'd gone with the more interesting option. So that was sort of the, the real life story. So these things are not um, you know, theoretical. They, they're life transforming if you start to really absorb them. So that's the typical bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. So I went with the bush here. <laughs> um, so. Let's, let's go to the next one, which is information. And in information, the head tells you to look at credible sources, and the heart asks you, are these compelling forecasts? And you know, one of the biggest myths in, in our field is that if you have enough data, then you know what to do next. And unfortunately, this is a little bit dangerous. The data is very important. There's no question about it. But our decisions are always about the future. In fact, there is no data for the product you're going to build because the world has not seen it, especially if it's an innovation. So you can't ask, you know, show me the data. Well, it's all made up. It's a forecast, and ultimately a decision is really an exercise of judgment. So that so it's, it's surprising to me how, how much you have to actually remind people about this, <laughs> that this should be obvious, but we are so involved in building new products, new, new innovation, that we forget this. So where this comes up is, Oftentimes, people who are very analytical, they lose perspective of the fact that historical data is not the full picture. In fact, when you rely just on that, it can create a big, big situation. So how many of you have heard, the, heard of this book, The Black Swan? Only two hands. OK, highly recommended reading. This created quite a stir when it came out. And this guy, Nassim Talib, he, he makes some very interesting arguments. And he looked at the field of financial engineering and how there's a there's an over-reliance on statistical models, looking at past data and then helping, you, helping guide decisions. And his point was that these models were so overly complex that they buried uncertainty. So any conversation of uncertainty could not be had unless you were a statistical PhD. And there, too, you were not interested in what the decision maker knew. You were just going to assume uncertainty on behalf of the decision maker because somehow you know, we thought we were more smart about this. Turns out we're not so smart, and uh, our models don't necessarily hold up. And um, you know, he he in fact argues that the whole financial collapse happened because people were not having very straightforward conversations on uncertainty. Now, I happened to do an internship at one point with a banking software company in India, and India, both India and China, escaped the financial collapse. And I was very interested in how that happened, and what I discovered was just shocking. <laughs> In India, most people, most, most bankers, have not studied financial engineering. So they actually don't use statistical models, but they use their judgment saying, well, is the person I'm giving a loan to, is this person a policeman, a lawyer, or a politician? If so, I don't want to give a loan because those people do never pay it back. <laughs> right? And then there were other things like, do I know the family of the borrower? Do I know all, the, all these markers 
which have just evolved over God knows how many hundreds, if not thousands of years of human interaction that they use to guide their decision making. And so when we started building decision models for them, they were stunned because they're like, wait, that's how we'd like to think, as opposed to the statistical models that looked just at the past data. So that's, a, and in fact, I've written about this. You can read this link. I'll send the slides out. So this is a very big deal that looking at credible sources of information as opposed to statistical models is basically the, the core point I'd like to make. With that, um, I'd like to pass it to David and he's gonna give us an example where this came alive in his experience where the two sides came together. Thank you, Samak. So this is a business situation. There's a product called LightScribe made by HP. Um, it was around 2000, so I think it's more or less run its life. But uh, you have to go back into this time period. If you can remember the dark, bad days of the year 2000. So the internet was, was sort of off the ground, but people were afraid of it. This is a raise of Napster. Uh, so there's music sharing and piracy going on. A lot of viruses and stuff out there. People are afraid of how this is shared. The number one way to share things at this time in particular was music. And the way people were doing it was they were burning it to, DVD, to, to CDs and DVDs and then passing them around to their friends. And there was actually some questions about maybe this was more legal than transmitting over the internet because you were archiving for yourself and sharing as opposed to kind of publishing. So there was a whole bunch of stuff going on. Uh, and HB had this idea for a um, DVD burner that you could burn the DVD and then it would pop out and you'd flip it over and the same laser would write the label. If you've ever done this work, which some of you may have, Labeling these things is a real pain. No, normally you use a Sharpie, which looks kind of unprofessional and ugly, or there are all kinds of really complicated, fussy ways of doing print versions and stickers and all kinds of things, and they're horrible. So this really hit a sweet spot. Uh, so they're trying to build a new business. So the, uh, the credibility of forecasts, they have to predict things like, uh, what's the future use of CDs? So, where would you look if you wanted to find credibility around the future of, of CD consumption? There are some things you might go try to find. I, mean, I guess <clears throat> hindsight is twenty twenty, but I'd like to know what other technology people are developing that might get rid of CDs in the future. I mean, is there an interesting question to ask? Right? What, what are some of these? So HP probably had some way to figure out first what they were doing if they were doing anything and yeah. then figure yeah. out somebody else in the in the technology area was thinking about yeah if music was a big track so what was going on in the music industry and you'd see, you Napster was already out by that point so yes. you were definitely seeing a shift towards mp3s yes and yes that so those are great points so those are great hindsight points right so what they're doing is they have to pitch to management who might be skeptical and management says get me the data Right, find how long and so the they could look at how long the media does. So the so they go with credibility. So the most credible places here are the analyst reports. They get Gartner reports, and they get report. They had three or four an analysis analyst reports that all show this beautiful rise, and there are arguments in the analyst reports about what format is going to be the dominant one. So there's DVD plus and DVD minus, and and they're like, well, we gotta we gotta fit them all. And so they went through credibility, the quote, data. And then they make spreadsheets. And they put in spreadsheets, and they put this data in, and they show that they're going to make so much money, and so many people are going to buy. And then they argue about whether it's going to be 20 CDs per person used, or 25 CDs per person used, or they also got really wrapped around the axle on cost. So cost is really critical. This is a business where you make pennies, right? I mean, the margins in this in this business are very, very small. Cost control is really critically important. That's all pretty much serious issues. But they had done uh, engineering studies and had gotten the data. Show me the data on cost. How are we not going to lose them? And they go do engineering studies and they line up suppliers and they get preliminary contracts. They get the data and they have this beautiful um, estimates which they think are in plus or minus 5% sort of given the typical variance of engineering estimates. Uh, and uh, they're quite concerned that maybe they've messed something up and maybe the variance is plus or minus 10%. So, so one thing going on is there's this search for credibility. There's this search for data, like the data is going to show me the answer. Now the credibility is critical. 
if I'd gone and asked somebody on the street somewhere uh, what the forecast was, it wouldn't have meant anything, right? Because judgments, it matters who says and what they're thinking about. So they're onto something with credibility, but this pattern comes up over and over again. There's this fool's errand to find the data that goes well beyond the requirements to get basic credibility. So they're overloaded. You have a question? This kind of ties back to <clears throat> famous uh, Henry Ford quote where he says, if I would ask people what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. Exactly. But especially when you're dealing with technology, you, people don't know what they want. It doesn't exist, so you can't ask them, is it going to work? Indeed. Indeed you can. And, and, then, and then there's a, a decision process or an assumption that I can find data that will tell me the answer, right? So it's all forecasts. So this is where the compelling part comes in. It's like there's a kind of fallacy that if I get the right data, it'll tell me what to do and I don't have to be responsible for my action, right? It's actually sidestepping the heart side. It's both true, you need credible, but you can't sidestep it. So the question you have to ask is what would actually be compelling to you? What would actually move you to a new place? And usually the issue here is uncertainty. I'd say that's probably the number one issue, is that people, you know, you make a forecast to me, and I, I feel uncomfortable about it, so I ask you to do more. And what you do is create more detail. There's like a feedback loop here that's really destructive. Instead of asking, what do I need to understand so that I'm willing to move in this information, and that usually goes to, I don't actually understand this or believe it, or I think it's uncertain, or I think it might be higher or lower, so you've got to put that on the table. And that's about getting compelling information. So we actually did that. So one rule is to open up the space. If you just say we're going to go do a Monte Carlo analysis, actually working its way into the vernacular, you might be able to get away with that. But if you can connect to meaning, that's better. Keep compelling. What, what will move you forward? So we went through this in the LightScribe case quite systematically. And we took their bill of materials. This is their cost side. Remember, they're concerned that the range of uncertainty is too small. Their estimates might be off. We said, fine, make it plus or minus 10%. Let's see if this matters. Because I know that if I can analyze the plus or minus 10% and it doesn't matter, you will be compelled to action. Right now, you're wrapped up around, is it 5 or 10? It actually doesn't matter unless it's really critical. And there was a small voice in this that was asking the questions he was asking. Like, are CDs really around for a long time? And this voice was being beaten down because all these great credible sources from the various analysts were like, yeah, we don't need to ask that question. Boom, look at this report. Boom, look at this report. Boom, look at this report. Of course, those analysts are just junior MBAs, you know, doing exponential growth models. Uh, so, so they had some sessions and they developed some scenarios around this. And they started to look at what are the factors driving the upside and the downside of this market in the use of CDs. So they actually unpacked it. And this is where it comes back to the black swan. The release of the iPhone, or the, uh, the iPod and the iPhone, were black swans for many companies. They completely destroyed companies. And you can see this business might be relying on the assumption that CDs are to continue. So their black swan is the iPod. And they figured it out in advance. So this is the tornado diagram that came from this. So this is now analysis, uh, analyzing the uncertainties. So you take each range of uncertainty, and you do an input-output sensitivity, and you show which uncertainties matter to the value of this project and which ones don't. So the top here is a scale of net present value. That's a figure of merit for the business. And then this bar width shows you the range of uh, how attractive the opportunity is based on different scenarios about how these things work out. So here is the bomb uncertainty. That's their plus or minus 10%. And you can see that if the bomb, the bill of materials, is higher, yes, the business doesn't make as much money. And if the bomb is lower, the business makes more money. But this does not make or break the business. On the top, they had actually developed scenarios. So if MP3 players take off, then the business is small. This was done at a time when an MP3 player was a toy for a nerd who could put a couple songs in his pocket if he wanted. 
And they had seen that the breakthrough in disk drives, if that happened, would let you put a lot of songs on. And this was a couple years beforehand. Interestingly, they actually went to Steve Jobs with this idea, who said, uh, that's really interesting. I'm taking another direction. And they didn't figure that out for a couple years, what he meant by that. But uh, they had this on the map. And then they also had looked, if copyright favors disk distribution, then the business is actually really great. So there were some legal things that might make this the way things were done, which would have been great for their business. So they didn't know. And this did two things for them. One is it got them off these, uh, these issues, preventing a decision. They can actually proceed. Now, they still need to do work on this, but they can actually proceed. They don't need to hold the whole project. And then they develop contingency plans up here to deal with this issues. So they actually found a black swan before it happened, put their judgment in, and were able to move forward. So that's kind of the compelling side of this. Any questions about information? So in this particular example, the values are quite straightforward, right? So the kind of meaningful thing they're trying, the heart side of this is they're trying to innovate, they're trying to create a new world. But the, the, the measurement size, the, the kind of way you look at it is, is dollars, right? So that's a, that's a reasonably straightforward one. It's true in a lot of areas. But uh, values is a little bit more complicated than that. And to explain about values is our is SOMIC. So this used to be called, in the, in the original decision quality framework, we used to say preferences. The preferences was too narrow, more head focused. And in, in aligning groups of people and organizations, it really boils down the head side is, do you have clear metrics that goes beyond just the individual that we can agree on? And the hard side is, what's the noble purpose? What's underlying this whole conversation? And uh, you don't have to make notes, we'll give you the slides. But this is a very, very fascinating story here. Now, um, just to motivate all of this, why do you care about this conversation? Well, did, did, does anybody recognize what this is? Did you, did you grow up reading this story? Alice in Wonderland. Alice in Wonderland, yes. <coughs> so Alice in Wonderland has just stumbled upon the Cheshire cat. And so Alice tells the cat, would you tell me please which way I ought to go from here? And the cat says, that depends a good deal on where you want to get to. Oh, I don't much care where. Well, then it doesn't matter which way you go, so long as I get somewhere. Oh, you're sure to do that if you only walk long enough. <laughs> That's why preferences are important, right? If you don't know what we want, then you could go just about anywhere. This is, this is in the entire decision quality framework, this is the, the compass of our decision. If you do not know what you want or who you want to be, then there is no guidance possible. Everything else cannot be brought to a conclusion. So this is a very integral piece because there's another one. I think Professor Howard used to, when I took the courses, he used to say this. I think he might still be saying this, that for the one who believes every outcome is the right outcome, there is no decision to be made. But if you care, then you got to think about this. So I'm, I'm just going to summarize a, you know, my, my six years of PhD work or four years, I forget how much. But on one slide, so this is uh, not going to do justice to the complexity, but the core point is this, that metrics drive action toward what actually matters. So if you think about brushing your teeth, this is something we do every single day. The number of times you brush your teeth is not equal to what you're really after, which is dental health. In fact, dental health cannot be counted. You can count how many cavities you have, but you can't really count it. So in a sense, if you wanted to be a little provocative, you could say that whatever you're counting does not really count, and what really counts cannot actually be counted. It doesn't matter what it is in life, there's almost always something deeper that you're after behind the metrics that you're using. So what's the point of the metric if it's always never going to count what you really want? Well, metrics turns out are really awesome for driving action because they are black and white, and action is black and white. I, I can't say that I'm, I'm going to be here and in the office and at home at the same time. If I'm here, I am nowhere else. It's completely black and white. It's a commitment I've made, and it, it eliminates an infinite number of possibilities. And metrics are exactly like that. They are so black and white, they're completely artificial, but, and that's why they're so great for driving action. And the question is, can you use metrics that are thoughtfully designed that align your action with where you consider value lies? So if you use metrics thoughtlessly, it could generate a whole bunch of action. We've seen a lot of that around the world where it's not aligned with who we are or what we want. 
But if you are thoughtful about this, then it can go in a very different direction. And uh, I'll just give one quick example here. We were at a decision analysis conference recently, and there was a U.S. general there, and he was talking about the metrics he used for the for success in the war in Afghanistan. Can can any of you guess what you know? If you were consulting as decision analysts to the U.S. Army, what what would you suggest as a metric for success? I, my guess is it would kind of depend on what the objective is. I mean, what do you, let's assume you know what you know right now. You know the objectives. Just some context. It's anti-insurgency. It's, it's anti-insurgency. occupation. They're yeah. trying to, like, build something stable. That's yes. where they're coming from. Yes. Any ideas for metrics? Just some quick shout-outs. Percentage of school-going children. Oh, that's interesting. So I wonder what made you say that, but that's very intriguing. So the, the generalist at first, he considered the body count of the enemy. And all well, the enemy has an inexhaustible supply. That's not a great one. Then can you get from point A to point B safely? That had its own problems. Finally, he, he landed on the school-going children, and he focused particularly on women. So how many female children are going to schools? And that's because when people feel truly safe, they send their kids. But when they're really, really safe, that's when they send their female children. And so he literally had these Marines counting how many girls were showing up to school. And all these stories he told us, when, you know, the, the Taliban blew up the school seven times, the Marine Corps built it eight times, and they stayed put, and the Afghan villages were very grateful to them. So it's a very different way of thinking, and you wouldn't think that the March of Marine Corps would have this as a metric, which is amazing. And it aligns their decisions with their, with their core identity, or what they stand for. So. With that, I'm going to pass it to David. And David, you can tell us this magical story that we experienced. So let me give you a more <coughs> business example. Uh, this was one of the first projects Somak and I did together. Um, I was working with a company called Chuli Packaging. And they're trying to develop a growth strategy. And we have many different alternatives for, for, uh, for growth different markets you can go into and different kinds of technology you can use. And uh, it was a pretty elaborate project. It probably took actually like eight months. I mean, this is very significant. And, and meetings with the board and uh, huge workshops with all their senior executive team and lots of sub workshops with their various folks. And it all comes together at the critical moment. And the evaluation is finally done, and the decision analysis is going to be revealed to the executive team. And we're there with about 20, 25 people to understand and interpret these results and figure out the implications for action. And it's a, it's a heavily facilitated meeting. There is one small problem. The answer from the evaluation is, you can't tell. So we'd set up these directions, right? We'd really, we'd done all the stuff, and you can't tell. There's really nothing in the evaluation that would drive the argument one way or another. And I'm thinking, oh my god, what are we going to do? Because this is going to just be a giant fight, and all this time that we've put into this is not going to go anywhere. And Selmuk says, well, we have to really understand how value works, because the metrics we had been using were fundamentally financial ones. You know, how much money you're going to make, and maybe how much risk is there, and how much money you make, and stuff like that, which is, which is pretty typical, by the way, and is pretty much in I think for every business problem I've ever been in has those kinds of metrics in it. But this was the first case in my career where that actually just completely fell flat. Now, it's not like there wasn't some insight there. You could tell some things, but it really wasn't clear what to do with it. And so we were stuck. Uh, and Somek said, well, let's try accessing the heart side of this. What is the noble purpose? And I thought, well, are you crazy? How do we ask this group of high-powered executives what their noble? I mean, we're going to get some bullshit answer like you know integrity and you know this kind of stuff. And so what, the way we accessed it was through storytelling, and we actually paired these people up and had them tell stories about what is something that was a really meaningful experience in their career at the company. And uh, so you know you, you two might be paired up, and you'd you'd each tell a story, something you might want to share with your children, for example, or pass on to the next generation of managers. And then each of them introduce the other. So if you had interviewed her, you'd be uh, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Oh well, <laughs> Tia. So you you would say this is Tia, and uh, 
here was the key. You had to summarize Tia's value in her story in like one word. This is Tia. She stands for safe food, something like that. And then you'd be introducing your partner. And he, stand, he stands for access. And then you can tell a little bit about the story, right? So packaging in our world has made people get high quality food that could never possibly get it before at higher levels of safety, high level. And so we're telling these stories, and we're basically making a word cloud out of it. And there's a little bit of disentangling to do. We had to pull out, because they also stood for treating each other well, fundamentally. So there were a lot of things about treating each other well, about honesty and integrity. So we put that on one set of flip charts. And then there was a whole bunch of things about why we're here in this particular business, which was like safety and access and these kinds of questions. And uh, I thought we were up for a fight, right? Because the analysis wasn't resolving the conflict in the room. But if you looked at what they stood for in terms of their noble purpose, and I've got them all up here, it was safe, food, natural. So one of the things about packaging is that the better the packaging, the less preservatives you need in the food. In fact, there are, it's actually pretty complicated. There are modern packaging that makes uh, like our organic food chain possible. You need membranes that can let, the, like tomatoes, exactly, for example, live. And they respirate. They actually, and you need gas exchange across this border while simultaneously stopping germs from entering and so on. So it's a lot of technology there. That's natural. Uh, sustainable and economic. So they had these all things. And they all agreed. And the energy in the room was just electric. They had finally hit what they really wanted to do and what they stood for. And some guy stood up and said, you know, packaging makes all that possible. And that's why we're all here. And people were ready to cheer. Like, packaging makes it possible. Why don't we call our strategy, packaging makes it possible. Let's go find things that are going to drive the new growth in that area. Lots of excitement. I'm thinking, OK, what do I do with that analysis? So I got motion in a, in a room and in a group and some alignment. And we went back and we looked at the analysis about what should you do. And it turned out that if you looked at the analysis through this lens, it was dead obvious what you should do. So all the things that we couldn't resolve before completely teased apart. It looks like we've been looking at some kind of complex problem this way. And this moment, this thing, we started looking at it this way, and then it's obvious. And those two things came together to drive a great answer for them. And they were jumping out of their chairs to make it happen. And so those two things came together there in, I think, a really, really dramatic way. So next, I want to talk. Any questions about that? Let's move on to integration. Now, in previous versions of decision quality, this has been called analysis or logic or reasoning. And uh, we've moved past all that because those are all the head side. And so our neutral word is integration. That is, how does it all come together to produce some kind of result? And the head side of this is insightful reasoning. You do need to use your decision analysis frameworks to come up with interesting new things that people haven't realized before. So that's the insight part. It's very much part of it. But that's not enough. You also have to have a compelling that's an inspiring narrative. And here I really do mean storytelling. There is something in our brains that we access through stories that gives us a context or a framework for changing our behavior and action. And at the end of the day, the better story will win. And part of our responsibility as decision analysts is to make sure that story is lined up with something that's actually good to do. It's easy, or relatively easy, for someone to have a great story and inspire all kinds of crazy action. In fact, I think a lot of our world's problems could be from stories that aren't resting on sufficient insight. But getting those to come together is critical. So I want to give you a really concrete example of this. Um, I worked for Sony Pictures early in my career. There's the gate at Sony Pictures. And we were doing corporate strategy for them. Now, this is uh, early 90s. So just to put you back into that time frame a moment, the Berlin Wall had fallen. Eastern Europe was rebuilding. Um, massive technological innovations. You're just starting to see digital film editing 
while I was there, they did the first digital movie that they had projected. They, had, uh, they streamed it from one place to another. I mean, it took just like millions of dollars of equipment at that time. Um, and home theater was on the rise. So you were starting to get these screens with about, about like that big. And a lot of people were watching in home. And in home watching creates a huge problem for the movie industry at this time because the way you make money in a film is you have to extract every penny. So you make a, f a film, it takes you several years, many, many millions of dollars, and you've dug yourself a gigantic hole. And then you release it to cinema. And then people watch it. Well, you don't make enough money in the cinema. And then you have to go from the cinema into, um, maybe, maybe you release it in the, in the United States, and you go to international. And then you release it to uh, uh, videotape or DVD rentals. And then you pass it off to network television. And then you pass it off to uh, toys. And there's this huge, huge chain of things that you have to make money on. And you've got to be able to extract every penny. So the, the essence of the strategy is like, which parts of that chain should we own for ourselves? How much money should we extract at each point? <coughs> Should we own the content that runs through that, or should we own the distribution channel? Should we own the networks? Uh, cable television is also really on the rise. It's wiping out the, the standard television networks at this time. So that's all kind of in this space. And again, another very major project. And I was the, in charge of the analysis. And we did the analysis, looking at all kinds of things. You know, Which cable provider should we buy? How much should we invest in distribution, et cetera? Just this giant, giant list. And the uh, results of the analysis was that it was clear that what created the most value was buying up stuff in Eastern Europe. Everyone wanted to buy the stuff in the United States because it was, they knew it and they understood it. They were kind of paying retail for it. It was established. But Eastern Europe was rebuilding. And so that was my analytical result. And it was, it was I mean, once you did the analysis, it was dead obvious. It was, it was just no contest. It's like you had to go that way. Um, and I present this. So there's a, the, the head uh, executive who was in charge of the project. And I had like my day with him to explain the analysis. And we're working through it. And I, his name was Mel Harris. And I'm like, OK, here's the analysis. He's like, so what? I'm like, no, you got to go, go international. It's like, I, I don't get it, David. This doesn't, you know. And he just starts pounding on me and pounding on me. And I'm a, a fairly junior guy at this point. And, uh, I, and I held up pretty well for a half hour or an hour. And he keeps at me. It's just relentless. And pretty soon I'm starting to bleed all over. And uh, figuratively, he's not actually threatening me or anything. But he's just asking me all these adversarial questions and calling me on the carpet and wondering about the quality of my analysis and explaining how I'm not clear. And you know, then I'm thinking, OK, I'm going to get fired. And he beats me up some more. And I'm thinking, maybe I should resign. And he beats me up some more. And I'm like, he asked me some more questions. He said, I got nothing. You know, what do you want to do? I'm done. I, you know, what do you, what do you want? I'm like, leave if you want. You know, what do you want? And he says, David, I think you really do mean international. I said, yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's what the analysis says. He says, David, the problem is you're explaining it all wrong. So he got it, actually, after all this. He, in a way, he was testing my mettle, I think, is what he was doing. I'm sweating. I mean, it's really a miserable experience. He says, David, you're explaining it wrong. Let me tell you. Let me help you out here. I'm like, OK, that would be great. <laughs> a lifeline would be really nice. He says, you're, you've got all this math. Nobody cares about the math. What you have to explain to them is how we missed B sky B. So B Sky B, at that moment in history, was the most profitable business ever. It was the first regional satellite over Europe. It was the first regional broadcast satellite for distributing entertainment. It was over Europe. Uh, and it was broadcasting to pretty much all of Europe. And they were streaming shows. It was kind of a cable play. And this thing, if you, at, at that moment, was the most profitable thing ever. But if you rewound. It was a desperate, risky venture trying to get off the ground. And what he said was, what you have to tell people is we missed B Sky B, and we never want to do that again. You see, we go in, B Sky B came to us. Our movies 
give us a seat at the table. Because everyone who's building entertainment infrastructure needs a good source of movies. We're one of five major providers. They all come to us. And we think we need to extract every penny from those movies. We need to get the absolute premium best deal. And that's what we did with B Sky B. And so we got the premium for the deal. And it turned out that was not the right thing to ask for. Because if we had gotten merely a good deal, they would have given us equity very cheaply. We could have owned half of B Sky B for practically nothing. And we have to reframe our movies from extracting the value to chips to get the equity as Europe is rebuilding. I'm like, OK, Mel, whatever you say, we'll go with that. Now, I think he actually had a lot to it. He's in the entertainment industry. He was the head of television, right? So, he really, so we go into the, no, that's the rehearsal, right? So we go into this thing, and I'm presenting my answers. David's now going to present the analytical results. I'm like, Mel, you're going to kill me again? So I'm presenting the results. And, and they're all scratching their heads, and they're confused. And uh, they're like, they start to ask me some of these questions. I'm like, oh, shit. Now it's going to happen to me in front of the whole like, executive committee. And Mel jumps up, and he says, David has really figured this out. But you know, he's not, he doesn't know how to explain things very well. So let me tell you what he's trying to say. And he says, we could have owned B Sky B. And he gives a little version of this. It was like 15 seconds that he had this story. Because you know, when I told you, I had to give you some background. For them, they don't need the background. We could have owned B Sky B. And if we do this differently, we're going to own the next whole set of them. And everyone goes, holy shit, that's right. Let's go. But that was it. We were done. And so it was those two things that came together, right? So the analysis served a purpose. One is it helped us figure out what the right answer actually was. And the second thing is it gave credibility or grounding to the problem. You know, why, why should they believe? But it was the story that actually landed it and got them integrated and let them rewire their past into a new future that they wanted to create. And that was the key. So that's the stories. You need compelling narratives, and it really was a story. And I don't know, I grew a lot that day. <laughs> Any questions about that? All right, let's do the last one. A commitment. I've already alluded to this a little bit about how you get commitment. I mean, this whole thing about the heart, in a way, is about how you get commitment. But commitment here has two dimensions, actionable plans and aligned intentions. And let me start with the actionable plans, because I think people kind of understand this. It's one thing to say you want to take a course of action. It's another to do it, <coughs> particularly if it's complicated or requires coordinating with other people. Certainly, all business problems require coordination. And you actually have to have a framework to make something happen, to create new action. And so that's planning, right? So you've got to have resources. You've got to have milestones. You have to have scope and sequence. We're going to do this, and then we're going to do that, and we're going to do this. And you have to have a governance process to check in with it, and all of that. It's absolutely critical. But it turns out that's not enough. In fact, it's nothing like enough. And the mistake is people think that's sufficient. Um, and there are kind of two problems here. Uh, one is uh, that people sometimes say yes when they don't mean it. We did a lot of work at General Motors, and there was something called the GM nod. <laughs> this was everyone would go, yep, OK, we're behind you. And they completely didn't mean it. And you actually had to have filters out and ask your spies, did they really mean it or not? Are we getting the nod, or is this a real yes? But I thought that's, that's kind of a, you know, to try to figure it out at the end, are we getting tricked, means actually we didn't do our work up front. For some reason, they're not, they're not with us. So that's part of it. And the other part is that every great endeavor will fail. Every single one will fail. And when something doesn't go according to plan, which is practically everything, what happens next? And do people around the plan that just failed, do they say, ah, this is my opportunity to uh, stab this guy in the back and get rid of this stupid thing? Or do they say, you know, it's a great idea. The plan wasn't right. Let's pick it back up. We need some more resources there. We need to do this here. We need to change that there. So the thing about intention is do people really intend 
to create the result that the decision calls for. And that's completely a heart issue. And a lot of doing these hard things make that land. But most folks mistake the plan for the intention. And to give us a really concrete example of that, back to Somic. So we are in the business of doing grand things, and we have our visions and so on. But it takes a lot to pull something off. And my story comes from the software development world. How many of you have heard, how many of you are familiar with programming here? Okay. Have you heard of test-driven development? Uh, anybody? OK. So test-driven development is basically the act of writing tests before you write your code. And it's, it's a very interesting psychological practice, because most programmers, they, they like building new things. And they don't like wasting time. So if you tell people you've written a piece of code, now write a test after the fact, they're like, OK, you're wasting my time. I need to write the next awesome piece of code and move on. But I'm being forced to write the test. So the test tends to be a very low quality. So the test-driven development movement is you write your test case before you've written the code, and you write the minimal code needed to make the test pass. That's the only way you'll write tests of high integrity. So that is the general philosophy, and it's become a pretty, pretty much a part of the standard programming you know, practice in our current time. And uh, in our products, I was trying to change the culture and make this happen. So I got our team together and said, well, this is what we want to do. And everybody agreed philosophically this is the right thing to do. And we set certain milestones. We said, OK, we want 100% test coverage in this core area of our system. And I look at the code over several months, and I don't see the tests. So I was like, what's going on? And then I keep asking for it. And again, I get agreement saying, yes, this will happen. And yes, these are the you know, goals. And it still doesn't happen. And then finally, I realized that it's not enough to say, yeah, I agree with you philosophically. You're going to do it. It's like, there's another step, which is, do they actually understand what's being asked? And if you don't understand what, you, what you're saying yes to, then there isn't an aligned intention, because there is no common ground here. So I, it turned out that writing tests is not easy for, for people who've never done this before. So I had to literally you know, find a way of teaching my team, well, this is how you think through this. And uh, we had a very senior developer. And he, in order to help him out, I basically you know, hired a friend, another friend of his, with whom we could build a full testing framework. And then once I finished with this friend, this friend went back to him and taught him. And it was only after he learned it that he said, oh my god, this completely changes the way I think. And he got it. And once he got it, um, you know, connecting with what David said, that people start owning the problem. So, so later on, when we were making, you know, fast forward a couple of years, now we're making testing strategy. And he tells me, oh, test driven development is great, but it won't work here and here and here. We need some other paradigm because he's completely gotten it and he's seeing much further than I can see. And that's a real success. That's like, oh my God, we've got a real commitment to action here on this philosophy because now this person has understood it and has aligned intention with action. So this is a big deal. I mean, a lot of projects die because of, you know, you know we, we don't do a, enough of a good job of understanding whether the person understands this and is capable of aligning their intention. And then, of course, the head side is, do you actually have your milestones? You have it all worked out. So that's just a little story there. I want to end with a little case. Um, this is, again, a real life story of a friend of mine. And this friend says, um, you, know, so, you know, so the story is that a friend contacts me and says, hey, I'm trying to find this you know, new home. At the lease of the current place we're staying in is running out. And I found this new home, and uh, I want to get it. How do I impress the property manager? Why, why do you want to impress the property manager? Well, I was just thinking that if I you know, do the credit check, pay 100 bucks to these you know, automated services, does that increase my odds? So well, let's back up a little bit. Why are you going to a property with a, you know, with a management? Because usually these are very impersonal. You can't build good relationships, and they don't generally care. And then there's a lot of turnover. You make a relationship with a property manager. He's gone in a year. It's a new person, again, scratch. Would you not care about relationships? And then she says, you know, actually, I do. OK. Then this new place that you're thinking of, tell me about the sunlight here. 
And there's a, you know, there's a lot of thought that's gone into good design. If you're going to live in a home, there are these best practice patterns, like for instance, light on two sides of a room. So people have found that if you don't have light on two different sides, you're not going to use that room very much. That room remains unused because as humans, we're attracted to light. So how does that home do in, on that metric? Well, it um, actually doesn't have that much light. <laughs> well, what about the cooking range? I hope it's gas. No, it's electric. Oh, well, then so you're, you know, if you're cooking, the food is going to take longer. It won't taste exactly the same. If you know about cooking, you know the importance of fire. So, yeah, so then, okay. So we, we, by the end of that conversation, this person was feeling pretty depressed. So I said, well, maybe you have to back up and instead of looking at this particular property, why don't you do, go to Craigslist and look at all the properties out there and see which ones meet this criteria. So with a heavy heart, this person said, okay. And then I talked to her a day or two later and then I was feeling really bad. Maybe I shouldn't have interfered. And then she said, you know what? The questions you asked were absolutely right. My values are aligned with relationships and with sunlight and getting, getting a home that is livable. And what I realized after looking online is that the current place I'm at is actually the best because it meets all of the criteria. It's just that the, the rent will increase, but that's fine. It's far cheaper than moving out and finding a place that doesn't work. So in our case, this is kind of the counterpoint to the original story <coughs> that David started with. The decision was not to move at all, and it saved a ton of money, and this person has a livable environment. So I'm kind of curious, so how do you see the elements coming together in the story? Do you, which element do you think was at play here? Or multiple elements? How do you feel the decision quality framework that we've talked about? You better show it. Yeah, let me show it. Yeah. Yeah, um, for one, you started framing the problem. So she was adamant about impressing the landlord and you had her step back and say, wait a minute, is this, is this really the right problem to be considering? Uh, but based on what? Based on which element did you <clears throat> ask that question? Well, uh, you, we talk, you, she had a useful perspective to it, but you brought meaning. What is, it, yeah. what is it that you're truly trying to achieve here and, and what is the underlying principle that you want to reach? Which is, and which, that's the value. And that's value also. Right. Yeah. What, what's underlying this whole conversation? Well, what is the ground on which we're standing? And who are you as a person? And somehow, the, every time you go to values, it changes your frame. It's a, it's a very special way of listening to the situation. And there's also a lot of talk about metrics there and how she was right. measuring um, the important things to her. Right. What about credible information? It wasn't, that, that was just the beginning part of the conversation would change the frame, but then she did go online and then she did look at Craigslist and saw, Craigslist is pretty credible, you know, the, you, you get a sense of where the market's at and there's no, you know, I mean, that, that's not controversial. I was like, okay, here's the amount of money we're going to spend and we can't find anything better. Guess what? The current place is pretty good. So she used that element as well and the interesting possibility, I thought, was the fact that she realized the current place is actually pretty darn good. And, and suddenly discovered, and she was also getting married, so she was like, oh my God, I have to get all this done by the end of the world. Oh, I don't have to do anything. I'm already done. So somehow it just all fell in place. And now, you know, that's the, you know, and the narrative is, you know, that's, this, this is going to be a livable hope for us based on the things we care about. And the analysis, the money, it all works out. So it's kind of interesting how it all came together. Again, this was a real life example. So yeah, she was, one other thing to say, she was moving because her place was too expensive. Yeah. And she realized it was the other one that was too expensive. It just wasn't measured by money. Right. Um, I just want to underline that because uh, he's making a point about using decision quality is sort of a guideline or a consulting tool, right? So he's presented with a problem. He's in a, he's in a kind of coaching, consulting relationship with her. And you know, you know that maybe not all this is solid, right? So she has this frame very solidly. She wants to know how to impress the landlord, right? Or the, uh, the property management. But Somic engages values, right? He does that on purpose. 
which then opens, which gives him access to meaning, which bounces over to frame and gets her to reframe. She starts generating new options. She finds the information. She gets clear about her metrics. Boom, the story lands together. It actually ties in with the story of narrative, the, the story about being married and setting up this life and what's the right place for it. And ultimately, well, the plan, commitment's really easy because it's actually the no op action option. But so I just want to you know, think for yourself, this is a kind of um, lens of engagement, I guess, a way to a, a sort of levers to pull or things you can do to help somebody move forward, which is what's illustrated nicely in this example. With that, I'm going to pass it to you. Oh, you are passing it back yeah, to me. Yeah, I'm passing it to you. Perfect okay. Transition. All right. So um, let me ask a question first. When are we finishing? She? 4.20. Okay. We have four, we have four minutes. So well, we probably started 10 minutes late. So I don't know if that counts. Is it 4.30? Um, well, so let me. Okay. We have extra five minutes. So. So you want to think about using this instrumentally. So by way of closing, let me give you the um, a kind of way of looking at a situation. I call this the sufficiency principle. There are two things that get in the way of making decisions. Roughly speaking, these map onto head and heart. So if you look at the uh, x-axis here, this is the, prob the problem difficulty. So if you look objectively at this problem, figuring out what Sony Pictures should do next is a massively complicated problem. A lot of problem complexity. Um, figuring out where, what you want to do to reinvent yourself, this one I started with here, of your house, is not that complicated the way that the Sony Pictures one is complicated. But it is complicated in terms of like people, organization. Uh, it's not organization. That's a personal example. But you know, husband and wife have to come to some kind of new understanding. That is a complicated process on this people dimension. In organizations, people off, often maps onto things like conflict, organizational barriers. There are groups and companies that don't talk very much. I mean, they're in different geographies and they have to come together. That's a people complexity problem. So the, the principle is this. The more difficult it is on the people dimensions and the more difficult it is on the problem dimensions, that is the harder the head and the heart, the more effort or, int or structure is needed to drive a decision. So if you're down here, it's pretty simple. You can take a simple approach, maybe just some discussions. If it's way up here, you need a much more complicated approach, much more explicit, much more deliberative, much more thorough, if you're going to actually drive the action. And here's kind of the head of that. So as you start with the simple approach, adequate, you can use the decision. This is a do-it-yourself decision quality checklist. That's what Soma just illustrated with this house choice decision, right? He just sort of walked through the elements and didn't even do it very systematically. But he kind of used it to probe and, and move the thing forward. The example I gave you with Sony Pictures and also for uh, Sholey, actually, is way up here. Multi-step dialogue with special teams and points of communication. It was actually managed as a project in itself. Uh, we do a lot of work that's uh, workshops, uh, a few days, or maybe a day. Just come together and pound through the whole thing and really work at it. We do a lot with software. So we've set up structures um, where people can work with the software in a routine way and out pops answers that are, that are really great. So that's what I call uh, embedded decision analysis. That is, you build it into the organizational structure so it happens routinely. So that's kind of the head of it. And so if you're thinking about being a decision uh, consultant or imp uh, if you want to help companies achieve a great decision every time, then you might want to be thinking about how you want to use this sort of thing. And I would certainly recommend the bottom one for anybody, anytime. I mean, anything that gets to any level of complexity, whatever, just check in with yourself. There's also the heart of decision analysis. Um, and I think of this, I can map this back onto the project plan. Uh, I may have shared some of this with you before. But I, I realized when we were preparing for this talk that this is actually the heart journey that people go through. So people need to go through something like these steps in order to land in a new place. You have to believe there's a problem really worth solving. As I said, the 
People don't move until the pain of the present is bigger than the fear of the future. So somehow they have to say, something's not working for me now. And then they need to go through some sort of process that opens, gets them to explore options, consider new things. That's a kind of exploratory mindset. Then they have to close it back down and come to some kind of answer. And then once they're clear on what they want to do, they need to convert that to something that's actually actionable. So this is a kind of uh, heart journey. And people aren't often good at engineering their own heart journeys. So you might be helpful in that too. And it's part of decision quality in a way, right? You tend to do more of the framing kind of stuff, more of the exploratory stuff over here, and more of the sort of hardcore analytical stuff over here. But people also need guidance on when to relax, when to open up, when to just explore, when to shut down. And that's also an element you can bring in doing the head and heart of decision quality. So with that, what questions do you have? So I'll bet one of your questions is, what kind of chocolate did I bring? <laughs> and it's mint is the answer. My favorite food is chocolate, and I always bring some, and I forgot to do this at the beginning. So I'll send you all off with some chocolate. Any closing remarks, Sumik? There are no questions? Well, it, it's, always, it's always surprising to me that how much insight you get by looking at your heart. And it's, it's not in the mushy, warm and fuzzy kind of way, but there is a certain amount of analytical clarity that I find is just readily available when you look there, which is very, very surprising, very counterintuitive. And it's not encouraged by the dominant paradigm, or it's, it's not encouraged. It's just not something people think about that it would give you direction, but in fact it does. So, so it's kind of, you know, and everything else, if you watch any Hollywood movie, they say follow your heart. Why would decision making be any different? So that's, that's, that would sort of be my Indeed. ending line. So I hope you guys will carry decision. Uh, yes, go ahead. Uh, so I think about the company, so the idea you have some of your analysis, but then you can make a really good story about it. Yeah. And but it all goes back to, yeah, but the analysis is not good enough. So does that mean the story is not good enough? Or? Well, the, the analysis is how you know the story is right. The story is how you get people excited and motivate action. And when, they're, when it works, they actually re they point the same way. That is your intuition of the story and the analysis will lead you the same way. And the, the Sony example is a pretty good example of how that comes together. Yeah, People often need less analysis than you realize. Because uh, our habitual response, well let me say, speak for myself, my habitual response early in my career was to take any question into an analytical direction. And sometimes that's exactly what's needed. So that's not wrong. But it's also limiting to have that as the only way you look at the world. Okay, you had a question? Oh, I guess um, my question is if you were to assign a percentage, or you could assign a percentage of how much um, of the analytical part is versus the hard part is for a decision. What would you <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I wouldn't actually. Um, because the point is, I mean, so Sumik's comment there was to legitimize the heart side of it. And it's the integration. That is, you yeah. can't, it's, it's not an either or, it's not a percentage. The question is, how do you get an answer that is in your best interest that's really going to drive things forward? That's the heart side. You need the cool head and you need the warm heart that you're actually committed to doing. And if you can't do both, you don't got anything. If you just do the analysis, you're going to have that. And it's really contextual. So it's like, in that situation, what is the obstacle that I need to move forward? And you've got to have your feelers up. That's a way of, another way of looking at decision quality is at the head heart side is, where are my feelers up? Like in frame, right? Is there sufficient meaning here? You may not talk directly about that. It may be completely analytical. But you've got to have your feelers up. Is, is this something people care about? Are they willing to go on this meaningful inquiry journey with me? So um, not a direct answer to your Well, I suppose it's a sort of answer to your question. I can build on that a little bit. So when I was working on the Amazon rainforest problem, I was just a freshly minted PhD. So of course, I was showing off my DA modeling superpowers. 
And what I learned the hard way was nobody cared. In fact, it was specifically because of my modeling that I lost a lot of people because they were like, this is so amazing and it works and you've solved the problem, but we only need, we can only do this when you're around. I was like, no, you can learn. I'll teach you Excel. I'll teach you how to use my model. It's so well documented. Oh no, this is so scary. And I realized that I screwed it up because I was leading with the solution instead of understanding how to let them connect with the narrative, how to bring their heart into it. And so, believe it or not, after five years of that experience, after I joined Smart Org, we landed back in the nonprofit space and we're back in again. And this time, again, now we had the software, so things are a lot less complicated. And this time we led with a metric with multi-attribute decision analysis. And again, I found people saying, oh, it's too complicated. So then we... Then we took the third attempt. This is how many times it takes to get something done. And the third attempt, we finally said, and, and uh, this time, David Jonas said, well, do we need really need to make this complicated? What if we make it that simple? And as a decision analyst, you're scared of simple things because it can't be that simple. So with a great bit of trepidation and resistance, we said, okay, let's try something really simple. And this was for a nonprofit which cared about two things. And we said, instead of combining them, which is gonna let you see how your projects stack up on those two things. And it just moved them forward in a way that you would not believe. Because they could clearly see that the projects they wanted stacked up in one dimension, not the other. They understood that there was no mental gymnastics needed and they could drive the conversations they had in mind. So it was like head meeting heart. And it was profound. It's, it's, and it's embarrassing how, how much our, our mental sophistication stops people from finding a way forward. It's completely embarrassing. That's, uh, that was my biggest learning in the last several years of doing decision analysis. So I'm learning to actually slow down and not just hit people with math or hit people with models. That's been my biggest learning. Yeah. I don't know if you have any. No, I, saw, I think the equivalent one is just simplify, simplify, simplify. Yeah. It's been a journey of general simplification. And every particular situation has something complicated in it but you don't need all the complexity yeah. for everything all the time. And you, you need a big, good toolkit, but it's actually about simplicity and, and you can map that onto the heart kind of thing. Yeah. We should probably finish up unless there's a desperate question out here. So uh, please go off, take the 21st century. You guys are the 21st century, right? Uh, I, Pomuk and I are transitional figures. I guess more so me. I got my PhD in the last century. So uh, yeah, I'm still in this go one. take the 21st century ideas, build on them, make them your own and get to a great decision every time. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.